And I'm using 2 Corinthians 3.8 as my text verse. So um, can you say it with me, though? The greater glory of our resurrected spirit. Put your hand on your heart and say, Lord, make your resurrected spirit come alive in me today that I would be fed manna from heaven for my spirit in Jesus' name. So if there's a greater glory, that means there's a regular glory too. So let's see what it says in 2 Corinthians 3. God equipped us to be capable servants of the new covenant by the Spirit who brings life, okay? So there's that language again. We've got, if we've got a new covenant, there must have been an old covenant, right? So Old Testament, New Testament is part of that language. We're living in the new dispensation. And some of us like to say we're living in Acts chapter 29. You know what I mean by that? Because the book of Acts really only has 28 chapters. But we're living in verse 1 of chapter 29. Because the church started and the church still continues. And regardless of what the statistics say about America, the global church keeps growing. The kingdom of God keeps expanding. And maybe our, our flourishing has gotten to us and we became a little, as a country, we became a little too smug about all the prosperity we had and we forgot why. But if you look at the dollar bill, it says, in God we trust. Still says that. And I'm glad it still says that. Because you don't want to trust in anything else. So God equipped us to be capable servants of the new covenant that we're living in. Post-resurrection is the new covenant by the Spirit who brings life. How many of you have the Spirit who brings life living in you? Yeah, every hand should go up. If you're a Christian, every hand should go up because it says you cannot say that Jesus is Lord unless Holy Spirit is the one that drives that force in you. That's the energy that's inside of us now. It's not just based on the food that we eat. There's a spirit of energy on the inside of us that's like fuel in our tank. And it's really good news because he's got so many names that the one I really like is the spirit of truth. So, like, you're never too far away from the truth if you just ask him, like, what's the truth in this situation, Lord? Like, ah, oh, I don't like that answer. I want a different answer. <laughs> but no, if we're going to be conformed to his image, then we yield to the Spirit. And the Spirit will never tell us to do something outside the will of the Father. Amen? So we read Scripture. We don't just read it. We study it. But then we depend on Holy Spirit to help us interpret it, as well as other mature believers. Because when we compare the testimonies in this room, it's off the charts, right? So one thing you're suffering through, another person might have had victory over that. Oh, awesome, right? So then in verse 7, it says, now consider this. And whenever you read those kinds of statements, that means there's something he wants you to dwell upon. And in case there's new people here, there's a really famous guy in the Old Testament called Moses. He doesn't look like Charlton Heston if you saw the movies about Moses, but he's very famous. And the Old Testament is really a history of the Jewish people and, and the covenant that God made with the Jewish people through Abraham. And, and Moses was a, a heroic figure in the Old Testament, and he struggled in leading all these people. But there's a phrase coming up here that I just wanted to qualify because Paul, the Apostle Paul was a very, very high level, uh, I, you would almost say like an, an officer in the army of the Jewish people because he had such a high rank as a Pharisee. He knew all the law and all the rules, but God just downloaded a whole new revelation of the new covenant that, that God was making with us. So he said, now consider this, if the ministry of death that was chiseled in stone, what would that be? What's the ministry of death that was chiseled in stone? The Ten Commandments, right? I, that's why I brought up Charlton Heston, because maybe you remember when he came up off the mountain. Remember how he was glowing, right? That's a scene. That's, everybody remembers that scene. But, but what Paul is saying is, you all that have been Jewish, you know how powerful that was, because when, when he came down with those tablets of stone, he was glowing, that's the glory he's referring to. If the ministry, of, the prior ministry of death, meaning that there was no resurrection power yet, it was following the law, if, if that ministry was, that was chiseled and so came with so much glory that the Israelites could not bear to look at Moses' face, even though the glory was fading. Hmm. Imagine the kind of greater glory that will accompany the ministry of the Spirit. 
ah, that's the greater glory of our resurrected spirit. That's the title today. The greater glory of our resurrected spirit. So no matter who you were, no matter how much glory you achieved before you knew God, there's a greater glory in you now because you have his spirit. And your spirit's not dead anymore. It's been resurrected. And that's why often some of the language in the Bible seems confusing because the disciples would say often, like, why do you keep talking in parables? Can't you just get to the point? And he would say things like, well, to you it's been known, uh, given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God. He's looking for hungry people that are willing to work a little bit to say, I'm not going to let go until you bless me. Who said that? Jacob, right? He was wrestling with God. That's what his name got changed to. His name got changed from Jacob, deceiver, conniver, to Israel, which means one who wrestles with God. And whether you know it or not, every one of you and me, we all are wrestling with God one way or another. <laughs> who is this guy telling me about me? You don't know me. Well, look, one way or another, we're all trying to put to work in our lives the truth that we study in the Bible and see in church, but we're all so different. We all have such a different thumbprint. We're, everybody's just a masterpiece in God's eyes. And, the, and after we become a Christian, that doesn't end just by saying a prayer. You then become a disciple. You go from a convert to being discipled, discipled, what? Discipled by Jesus. It's like in the old days, you would be an apprentice to the master carpenter. And you would follow him around, and you would try to do everything he did. And he would try, or she, didn't matter that the concept was doing it, not sitting in a classroom and filling out a notebook. You went and you followed the person around, and they trained you, right? Now, imagine if you wanted to be a good classical pianist, right, a keyboard player. What if you could have the spirit of Beethoven? Now, you can't. That's witchcraft. I'm just saying. What if... You wanted to be like Jesus, and you could have his spirit. You do. <laughs> Newsflash. You do. It's already in there. Do you need anything else? Well, application, maybe we could say. I need more revelation and application. So this will be the rest of our lives that we're going to be learning how to live this out. And that's the wrestling. Because I want to hold a grudge. They owe me an apology first. What's the truth here? Oh, I don't like the truth. I'll leave that alone. Greater glory. I have greater glory in my resurrected spirit. And anything that's stopping that from having first place, I want it to go. Amen. That's why we have a prayer ministry here. That's why it's a busy place, the prayer ministry team. Because we all got something that could go. No condemnation. Here's the verse I talked about earlier, Revelation chapter 1. When I saw him, this is John speaking in the last book of the Bible. We went from the old now all the way to the end of the new. Revelation chapter 1, John is talking, and he had a vision, and he, he's in heaven, and he sees the Lord. And he says, I fell at his feet. It was as though I was dead. But Jesus reached down, and he placed his right hand on me. Hmm. Anybody been touched by the Lord? <sighs> Do you remember that song, He Touched Me? He touched me. And oh, the joy that filled my soul. Something happened. And now I know He touched me and made me whole. Well, the something that happened was your spirit went from being dead to being resurrected and being alive. The same thing that Adam and Eve had in the garden before they sinned, they had resurrected spirits because they were alive in God. There was nothing hindering their relationship with God. Sin separated us, but now that we get saved, our spirit comes alive again. Who wouldn't want that? Somebody who's afraid to wrestle with God. <laughs> He's going to send me to Africa and be a missionary. I know it. He's going to punish me. Man, well, maybe that's not his only plan. This a bunch of good plans the Lord has. And the Bible says, if you delight yourself in him, he will give you the desires of your heart. So he'll drop his desires for you from heaven because he's your father. He knows best. That's for all the older people that know about that show. It used to be called Father Knows Best. Couldn't get that on the air anymore. 
But he reached down and placed his right hand on me. And this one, Jesus, said, this is not the time for fear because I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I entered the realm of the dead. But see, I'm alive now. And for all the ages, even the ages to come. When did he enter the realm of the dead? I didn't know this was going to be a quiz. It's a trick question. No. First of all, when he was born in the earth, that was part of the realm of the dead because people that didn't know him had dead spirits. Right? He was bringing not just the good news of salvation, but the fact that, hey, by the way, all people that were ever been born are going to live forever. And there's nothing you can do about it. Your spirit is going to live forever. And there's nothing you can do about it. Oh, man, that's not good news to some, some people. Because <laughs> they're afraid of the judgment. They're hoping that isn't going to happen. But look, we can't make it about earning all this, all this favor. It's just like the thief, the thief on the cross said, remember me. When you get into your kingdom, when you get to where you're going, remember me. And he said, today you'll be with me in paradise. There was no church attendance. He never got baptized. We don't know if he ever even read the Bible. It was just a decision in his heart. So he entered the realm of the dead the day he was born. But he, I believe, and Isaac Petrie, again, he, there's five hours of teaching on this on our, on our YouTube page if you want to dig into it. It's so good. Isaac said, no, it's three days in the belly of the earth. When, when he died on that cross, he descended, and that's where he got the keys of death and hell that we just read about, and he stayed down there for three days. Hmm, that's interesting. So another way that he entered the realm of the dead, but see, I'm alive now for all the ages and even the ages to come, and I possess the keys to open the prison of death and Hades, which is the same as hell. The keys of death and hell. Let me tell you, there's so many people in America that are living a nightmare that's like hell right now. Drugs, you name it. There's so many things we could list. That's not the point. There's nothing too far away from God that he can't turn around. And if their spirit gets resurrected because they say yes to the Lord, they're not going to want to do those things anymore. It's not that it's your willpower that's forcing you, like, oh, I'll get through another day. No, there's joy in saying, Lord, thank you for resurrecting my spirit, opening my eyes, taking the desire to do drugs out of my life. So I'm going to jump to Matthew 12 now. Mm, amazing book. And first book in, in the New Covenant that we, that we have listed. And he was, man, just brilliant. Uh, especially as his understanding of the Jewish law. So Matthew 12 says, the scribes were talking to Jesus said, Teacher, we want to see some miraculous sign from you. And Jesus said, you're looking for signs, are you? The only sign you will be given is the sign of the prophet Jonah. He spent three days and three nights in the belly of a fish. And just as the Son of Man will spend three days and three nights in the belly of the earth. All right? So there we go. There's the scriptural evidence that Jesus said this was going to happen. Matthew 27. We go to the crucifixion now. Good Friday. A lot of... A lot of church services on Good Friday to remember what the Lord has done. We had communion today, and, and that's the Passover meal. He said, I, lo I have longed to have this Passover meal with you, he said to his disciples. So when they had the Last Supper, that wasn't just the Last Supper. That was the Passover meal. And he got down, and that's where this statue is from, and he got down, and he, and he washed the feet of all the disciples. This was God in the earth saying that there's no position too low. Even for the king of all the kings, I choose to wash people's feet. So here he is at the crucifixion, and they didn't understand it, of course. I mean, you couldn't really grasp it all. They were really discouraged, and, oh, my God, how's he going to be king if he's getting crucified? Maybe he wasn't who we thought he was. So it says in verse 50, then Jesus cried out once more loudly, and then he breathed his last breath. And Matthew doesn't go into any more detail than that right here, but we know that he said, it is finished. Prior to that, he quoted Psalm 22, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So much written about all of that, but I just want to focus on what happened 
when he breathed his last breath here in Matthew, at that instant, the temple curtain was torn in half from top to bottom. Now, let me tell you, there's a whole message right there, but I'm not doing that. I'm just saying something big happened, really big. And Bill Johnson said when the temple was ripped in two, it wasn't just to let us in. It was to let God out. <laughs> Think about the tabernacle of David, right? If you know the Bible in the Old Testament, he brought the ark back in, and instead of putting it behind the curtain, he put it right out in front for everybody to worship. Not just Jews. Everybody could worship. That was looking like it was breaking the law, but it was a prophetic insight that all people were going to be able to come into the presence of God. Huh. So when this temple curtain torn, it was symbolic. And, and if you know much about the Old Testament, Isaiah said it this way in Isaiah 63, 1, Oh, that you would rend the heavens and that you would come down. And this is exactly what's happening in Matthew 27. The heavens are ripped open. It's a violent act of tearing something. It wasn't some kind, gentle God, kind, gentle Jesus. God was saying, now I can move the way I've been wanting to move. When he died, something shifted because he's the first man that ever lived 33 years or any amount of time with no sin and died with no sin. That was, should have been Adam, but he's, it says, the final Adam. Jesus was the final Adam. He came to undo the damage that Adam had done. Oh, that you would run the heavens. Is that still a good prayer today? Remember when we do this during worship? What's that mean? Open heaven over my life. Oh, Lord, take out any obstacles that are stopping me from hearing your voice. I want to get a better plan. I want to get a better phone system where I have unlimited bandwidth. And I have 24-7, 365, best connection. Yes, you have it. But sometimes the emotions just get in the way, right? So now in verse 52, it says the earth shook. The rocks split in two, tombs burst open, and the bodies of many sleeping holy men and women were awakened. You don't hear a lot of preaching on this verse, do you? What was that scene like? Well, first of all, you have to read it because then the next verse says, after Jesus' resurrection, they came out of their tombs. Oh, wait a minute. So on the day that the veil was torn in two. That was the Friday. They were awakened, but I, it just reminded me when I was reading it of those of you old enough to remember those old rockets. Remember when we used to watch the, the space? Everybody tuned in. Like, it was such a big deal back in those days. Now Elon Musk figured it out better than the government did, but back then it was a really big deal. And, like, you're sitting there, and you would watch this ball of fire just explode from underneath, right? But the rocket didn't move. And you're like, uh-oh, they made a mistake. All that fire is going to blow up the thing. It's going to blow up. And then a little bit at a time, it would start going. Mm -hmm. So even though they're awakened in the tomb, they didn't come out yet. Can you just imagine the dead body in the tomb and the eyes just open? But they're still in there. It's like hibernation. Isn't that kind of strange? Like, how can a bear go to sleep for whatever, I don't know how many months it is. I can't even get eight hours. I sleep for months. How does that happen? That'd be a good diet, wouldn't it? <laughs> no inflation problem if you don't have to eat for three months. So it started a process, and the rocket's on the launch pad, and the fire's coming out. But it's not till three days later, right? After Jesus' resurrection... They came out of their tombs. They went into Jerusalem and they showed themselves to people. Now I'll go back to the Old Testament for a minute. And, and part of what the law said was Aaron, the high priest, has to go to place the incense on the embers in my presence so that the cloud of incense engulfs the seed of mercy, which again, that could sound like another language if you're not familiar with the Bible. But the way God told Moses to set up the tabernacle was three three spots in the temple, three phases of it, three sections. You would walk in 
and you go into one, and then the, the Holy of Holies. So there was the outer court, the inner court, and then the Holy of Holies. And the high priest would go in to the Holy of Holies with, with the sacrifice, the blood, that's Aaron, the high priest. But first, he put incense on the mercy seat, and there was always a fire going on on that mercy seat. So he would add the incense to, to allow this cloud of smoke to rise up, but it smelled beautiful. That was the idea, right? Because it says that that's where the sins were atoned on the covenant chest. So you probably have seen the picture of the Ark of the Covenant and two angels, one on either side, kind of bending in with their, with their wings covering, and then that mercy seat was right in, on top of that covenant. And the priest had to come in. After he put the incense on that fire, he must then dip his finger into the bull's blood. That was a sacrificial animal. And then sprinkle it on the mercy seat. It's all symbolic, right? In all he is to sprinkle the blood seven times in front of the mercy seat. Again, that's another study for another day. But just understand the symbolism was you had to have a high priest represent all the people before God. And he had to do it the right way. So he brings the blood in and he puts it on the mercy seat. Now, we get a picture in, in the New Testament in Hebrews chapter 9 where whoever writes it, they don't know exactly who wrote Hebrews. Or there's some contention about it, but the person really understood the law. It says in verse 12, Jesus has entered once and forever. Say that, please. Once. Meaning the only sacrifice that ever needed to be made for you already happened. Once and forever. Jesus entered once and forever into the, sanct into the holiest sanctuary of all. And again, just a little background. When, when God told Moses how to build the tabernacle, he was modeling it after what's in heaven. You all know this, right? It's all symbolic. And the, the Israelites camped around. That was at the center. There was a fire in the middle that could never go out, right? So now Jesus, when he came out of that tomb and the temple, uh, I'm sorry, the the curtain was torn in two and the rocks cracked open. It's three days in the belly of the earth and now he comes up. And who does he see first in the garden? Wow, Mary? Well, she didn't qualify. Why should she be the first one, Jesus? I follow the rules better than she does. Not only that, it says that Jesus had cast seven demons out of her. But Christians can't have demons, can they? Mm. <laughs> I told you there's about 18 messages in here, isn't there? You can't be possessed, but you can be oppressed. You get hung up on language. He takes his blood, and what did he say to Mary? Don't touch me. I have not yet ascended to the Father. What was he going to do? He was going to take his blood into the sanctuary. He's the bull. He's the one that was sacrificed. Not with the blood of animal sacrifices, but the sacred blood of his own sacrifice. The only way it could have put out the fire that Adam and Eve started of sin and destruction and death. It had to be perfect sacrifice. And he brings it up into heaven. He alone has made our salvation secure forever. Under the old covenant, the blood of bulls was sprinkled on those who were defiled, symbolically cleansing them outwardly from ceremonial impurities. Yet how much more? See, the greater glory of our resurrected spirit, how much more will the sacred blood of the Messiah thoroughly cleanse our consciences? You know, guilt and condemnation and shame, man, what a weapon of the enemy. Yeah, but you did this. Yeah, but I'm a new creation. I did it. I'm not doing it. The charges have been dropped. My record has been expunged. Is that the greatest word ever, expunged? I don't know who came up with that, but what a great picture. It's not that you didn't do the thing, but you've been forgiven of it. And as far as the east is from the west, 
That's how far God removed your transgressions from you. So why are you going fishing for those things? Leave it at the bottom of the ocean. I got too much work to do for the Father. I'm not going to dwell on all the past mistakes. I'm looking through the windshield, not the rearview mirror. <laughs> no shame. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ. Romans 8, you know it. How much more will the sacred blood of the Messiah thoroughly cleanse our consciences? For by the power of the eternal spirit, he offered himself to God as the perfect sacrifice. That's what we celebrated Friday. That now frees us from the dead works to worship and serve the living God. What were the dead works? Oh, man. Trying to earn people's pat on the back. Believing a lie that I'm only going to be loved if I perform well. But unconditional love says I love you in spite of how you perform. I want you to perform well because I love you. And any good father wants their children to get A's. But maybe physics isn't your subject. <laughs> yeah, maybe. But maybe something else is. Guitar. I wish I had studied guitar. That would have been a good one. Any good parent, mother or father, wants their child to flourish. God wants you to flourish. And part of our role as ministry is to look at, at the gifts in you and ask the Lord, what do you see, Lord? I know what I see on the surface, but what do you see when you look at your daughter, when you look at your son? Help me see what you see so we can then help them walk into the fullness of their identity and who you made them to be. That's not a bad purpose every morning to get up. And help people do. Huh. So freed from the dead works of looking for other people's approval is only one out of about a million. But there's lots of dead works to worship and serve the living God. Huh. Now the next chapter, right? So that was chapter 9 in Hebrews. I was in the Passion Translation. This is the voice. Therefore, brethren, have in boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus. Wow, because in the past only the high priest could go in once a year. And they would put bells on their robe just in case they didn't do the, do the rules right. <laughs> they would go down and be dead, and they would have a rope attached to them, and they would pull the dead body out. That's why the bell, if the bell stopped ringing, we got a problem, man. I mean, he's dead. He, he did something wrong. And when they tried to take the ark back, right, from the Philistines, he was, he was a priest that touched the ark and died. Woo. 19th message right there, wasn't it? <laughs> but we have boldness. Like, this was so preposterous to think that little old me and little old you would now be considered priests. That we are now the temple. Our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. You have him. What are you doing with him? I want to leave. No, it's not meant to be condemning. It's meant to excite you, to say you have the most amazing gifts inside you already, the Word of God and the Holy Spirit. And now it's what we do with them that matters. So, brethren, having boldness, we can now enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, not our blood, by his blood. He brought it up there by a new and living way, which he consecrated for us through the veil. Not just the veil that was torn in the temple. His flesh was torn. And another one, let me tell you, I'm 100% I'm Italian. I had the uh, DNA test done. I know you don't meet too many, so, you know, just I'm half Sicilian, too. That's a problem. That's considered Italian. So I needed a lot of blood to cover me, man. Let me tell you, my ancestors were rough. When they put the, when they put the spear in his side... They were going for the heart. They knew how to kill people, okay? They weren't going to just stick it in his side. They were on a horse, and they, just, they did it so many times, they knew right where to go. Pierce the heart. Yeah, because then you'd know he was dead. Wow. All of this for me, for the joy that was set before him, the Bible says. He endured the cross for me. I don't deserve it. I know, we just sang it. Still, he gives himself away. 
He lets his flesh be torn open, and that's now the curtain into the presence of God. A new and a living way, which he consecrated for us through the veil. That's his flesh, and having now a high priest over the house of God, Jesus' role now. Let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled. See, instead of the, the mercy seat being sprinkled, our heart is now the mercy seat. Because you are a temple of the Holy Spirit. Don't let the fire go out on the altar of your heart. And now the blood of Jesus comes in. You can have confidence that the blood has sprinkled over your heart. And that takes away that evil conscience. And our bodies are washed with the water, pure water of the word. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. That's another reason we assemble together. Because when we're starting to get a little wobbly in our faith, that other brother just comes up. Hey, I was praying about you this morning. The Lord gave me a word. Isn't it amazing? Or Lucy talking about how this little girl just in worship, the Lord just symbolically used her for a truth. It's beautiful. Jesus said that we should be more like her than me. <laughs> be more like a child. Why? That sounds so backward. Well, the kingdom of God is kind of backward from the world. What can we learn from a child? Innocence, trust, faith, a whole bunch of good stuff, right? So let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promises faithful. And let us consider the one, I'm sorry, one another, in order to stir up love and good works. That's the person next to you. It says in another translation, spur, spur one another on. <laughs> <laughs> he knows what a spur is. That's what the cowboys use on the back of their boots to spur one another on. Like a truth sometimes can feel like a spur. But when it's done in love, it's okay. Amen? I'll take it. Stir one, ano one another up in order to stir up love and good works. And this is the verse. I didn't put the whole thing here, 25, where it says, and forsake not the assembly together. Right? It's so important that we're doing what we're doing today but also what Tim is leading, all the small groups, fellowship on Sundays when we have it. Like, it's so important just to be with other people. Colossians 1 says, you were buried with him in baptism and then were raised up with him by faith in the resurrection power of God who brought him back from the dead. So this is Paul again writing now, and you start to see this resurrection language is all throughout the Bible, New Testament, all throughout the New Testament. And, and he's just right in verse, first chapter of Colossians, he's reminded them that the reason that you go through baptism is it's a symbol of what, when they came out of Egypt, right? This is Passover weekend. We were just at Glory of Zion celebrating this. After all those hundreds of years in slavery now, finally God gets them out and Pharaoh's army is destroyed and now they're in the promised land, right? That's you and I coming out of the bondage of sin, coming out of that water. They came through the Red Sea, so the baptism was to go down. Your old nature dies. You come back up and now you're alive in Christ. And if you do that publicly, you're making quite a statement, aren't you? That means your family and your friends are coming and saying, uh-oh, they joined a cult. <laughs> what kind of crazy church is this? Can't be right. Well, it's not a cult, I promise you. I'm just saying this is what my relatives thought. Good enough. At least I'm alive. <laughs> I actually had an aunt say I like the old Peter better. I said, well, you didn't really know the old Peter, so maybe not. We were raised up with him by faith in the resurrection power of God. Man, that is so powerful. It's faith in the resurrection power of God. It says about Abraham that he was willing to bring the knife down on his son. You all remember what I'm talking about? And, and it says in the New Testament, because he believed that even if he had killed his son with that knife, that God had the power to raise him from the dead. That's a lot of faith. And it was accounted unto him for righteousness. Oof. When we were dead in transgression and immersed in its sinful nature, it was God who brought us to life in him. He disarmed those who once ruled over us. Spirits unlimited. Take that one. Cocaine. LSD. I'll stop. It's a long list. Those who had overpowered us. Like captives of war, he put them on display to the world to show his victory over them by the means of the cross. 
Friends, if there's no resurrection of the dead, then even the anointed one hasn't been raised. If that is so, then all our preaching has been for nothing. Man, that's 1 Corinthians 15. Same guy writing now. This is a radical statement. And some of the liberal parts of the church around the world say that the resurrection didn't really happen literally. It's just figurative of what it's going to be like when we are spending eternity with him in heaven. Not here. We're not saying that. He literally rose from the dead. In this chapter, Paul says, a lot of people saw him. 500 people. And I was on that list too. I was the last one that he revealed himself to. So, like, these are people that were eyewitnesses of what happened. Peter said it too when he wrote his epistle. He said, this isn't some fancy fairy tale that we're making up. We were on the mountain with him. We saw him transfigured with Moses and Elijah. So we're not following some cleverly. Why would they die for some clever myth? They wouldn't. They knew he rose from the dead. They knew he was real. Ha. Huh. Ah, but not only has our preaching been for nothing, your faith in the message is worthless. If Jesus has not been raised from the dead, then your faith is worth less than yesterday's garbage. Another tip to the hat to my family, garbage men. So one man's gold is another man's garbage. If he hasn't been raised from the dead, even the things you throw out are worth more than your faith. I guess he rose from the dead. And you're all doomed in your sins. If he didn't raise to the dead, just saying a prayer isn't good enough because there's no resurrection power. He couldn't defeat death on the cross. He could only defeat death by coming out of the tomb. That's when death was defeated. And all the dearly departed who trusted in his liberation are left decaying in the ground. If we have, if what we have hope for in the anointed doesn't take us beyond this life, Boy, I love the way they say it. Then we are world-class fools, <laughs> deserving everyone's pity. And if you know the King James, it says, if in this life alone, right? Remember that one? That's, if that's where our hope is, just in this life alone, alone, then we are to be pitied because there is the hope of a greater resurrection, a greater resurrection a greater glory of spending it with him forever, not just sitting on a cloud somewhere, but being actively busy with the Lord, ruling and reigning with him. Man, that's a good, that's good future. I'm almost done. It's 12.01. I'm doing really good. Can you say this with me? We will step out of our mortal clothes. Oh, I said with me. We will step out of our mortal clothes. That's not just this jacket I'm wearing. It's the body. That's what he's talking about. He, earlier in another portion of scripture, he says, this tent that we're living in is just temporary. It's just a tent. But we long to be in the eternal building that we're going to have. It's not just a tent. This one is subject to gravity. I'll just let you think about that one. <laughs> what well, used to be up here, it's not up here anymore. It headed south. What happened? But we came out of the ground, and we go back to the ground. So in this world, gravity wins. I hate gravity. <laughs> But, you know, Paul said, who's ever alive, when he comes back, you're not going to have to deal with that one. Those of us that aren't, look, this is, we're going to step out of our mortal clothes. This body is only temporary. But the greater glory is the resurrected spirit lives forever, and we get a new body. That ain't even on sale, not even a special. That's just what you get. And slide into immortal bodies. Now, can we say that together? We'll step out of our mortal clothes and we'll slide in to immortal bodies, replacing everything that is subject to death with eternal life. They're getting Pentecostal now. This is really good. Call the elders. 
oh, that's so well put. I'm going to step out of the mortal clothes, slide into my immortal body, everything being replaced that was subject to death with eternal life. Come on, say it now. And when we are all redressed with bodies that do not and cannot decay. Take that, gravity. You don't win. What's up here stays up here in that new body. Spanx. We're not going to need Spanx. I don't wear Spanx, just to let, let you know. I wouldn't have even known what it was. But I found out by mistake, not in my house. It sounds pretty bad, doesn't it? Spanx, I don't know. And when we are all redressed with bodies that do not and cannot decay, when we put immortality over our mortal frame, then it will be, as Scripture says, life everlasting has victoriously swallowed death. Ha. Huh. Stand up. This is a good time to stand up. We are anti-gravity Christians. Easter. Anti-gravity Christian right there. I heard Easter praying this morning during intercession. And, you know, it was just... I could tell you there's a hundred times that I came to church to set up for worship, and she was already in the sanctuary praying alone. <laughs> right? Like, just alone. And the microphone was on. Just so the devil would know. Like, don't matter if I'm the only one here. Me and God's, that's a majority right there. You know? So look, you know, that, that's just, that's how, that's how we have to live. In constant covenant relationship with God. And this hope is just amazing. It's not chocolate, Easter bunnies, <sighs> Easter egg hunts. I have no idea how that happened, and I don't want to know. I just think it's a disgrace when there's this much good news. When I tell you there were 10 more sermons just on resurrection. So, amen, I just gave you one. Yeah. Can you just lift your hands and say, Lord, just give me more greater revelation of the greater glory of my resurrected spirit. I don't want to be duped by the enemy. No, I don't, I don't want to be bewitched by the world's offerings. I want the truth of the word of God to be front and center in my consciousness every day. That I'm a child of the living king. I have a place at your table. And you, you want the best for me, even though there's times I have to wrestle for it. But I want to be like Jacob, who said, I'm not letting go until you bless me. That's not a selfish prayer, church. Not a selfish prayer. So I'm going to hang on and wrestle until I get the breakthrough. I just speak that over all of you here today that we are going to be wrestling Christians. Even with our own nature that still needs to die, there's always going to be something else that needs to go. That's not a problem. That's a good thing. Because we're getting a taste of what it's going to be like forever. The resurrected spirit, the greater glory of the resurrected spirit that he gave us. Thank God then for our Lord Jesus, the anointed, the liberating king. I think we should. Let's thank God for Jesus, the anointed, the liberating king, liberation from gravity. <laughs> I keep seeing myself anti-gravity Christian. The grave is not my final stop. I spend eternity ruling and reigning with Christ, ha, who brought us victory over the grave. I just wouldn't want to end today without at least offering somebody that doesn't know the Lord a chance to just say a prayer, to invite him into your life. That's, that's the one thing that everybody here has in common. They all made a decision to go from the world, that, the, the, the kind of lifestyle that they were living. I was, you know, playing music in bars and doing all kinds of crazy things. And it's really funny because 
Chuck kept using the word abar. I mean, and Robert Heider kept using the word abar. And I said, well, I've been through a few abars. <laughs> Thank God he got me out. Man. So the thing is, nobody's perfect. Christians aren't perfect. They're just trying to live through the grid of the Bible with the power of the Holy Spirit and the truth of, of the Word of God and living it out together. That's why this is so important that we're here together, that we're talking to each other and we pray with each other and, and you find your own group of people that you can talk to to help you grow. And sometimes grow means you have to leave some of those old things behind and that's scary. I get it. It was scary to me until I didn't care anymore because I was dying. I just, I knew I was going to end up dead if I didn't stop what I was doing. Now, you shouldn't wait for that. Don't wait till you get to that mess. What if it doesn't work? What did you lose? Nothing. Depression could be gone. Drugs could be gone. Money could be having babies in your wallet. <laughs> for, if my testimony is true, but, but I don't know, Christians, did he meet you right where you were at and make, make himself real to you? The way nobody else could have, if he did, make some noise, okay? Make some noise. It's just endless how many testimonies that things happen after people say a prayer and they invite God into their lives. How he proves himself to be real to you in that moment. And that's all I'm asking. Just give him a chance. You got nothing to lose and a whole lot to gain, I promise you. But you do have to surrender your will and say, I'm willing to give you my yes. I'm willing to give you my yes, and I'll trust you for the rest. Can you say that? I'm willing to give you my yes, and I will trust you for the rest. So it's not a hard prayer. Just say, Heavenly Father, I come to you in the name of your son, Jesus. I heard some things today that are giving me hope that there is a resurrection, that my spirit can be resurrected, my mind can be renewed, my body can be set free from addiction if I make a decision to turn away from a life of sin and to turn towards a life with you. That's a big decision. He's asking you to call him Father. By faith, say it, by faith. I take a step of faith. I call you Father. I call Jesus my Savior. And I invite Holy Spirit to come and empower me today and fill all the gaps in my life. All the lies be replaced with truth so that I can be set free and serve you for the rest of this life and for eternity. I bow my knee to Jesus, and I accept you as my Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. I think you should give a hoot and a shout for that one. Man, no better prayer and no better prayer. Put your hand on your heart. And the Bible says that he who began a good work in you is faithful to complete it. And if you said yes to that prayer, you started a process. You can go it alone if you want, but you don't have to. There's an altar right here. And, and that's what we do. We just come up to the altar and we pray. Now, there's not going to be a big team of people today because of the holiday. But, but if you said yes, we want you to come up. And just say, I'm making a public statement that I'm turning away from that old life. And I'm, I'm turning. Instead of running from God, I'm going to run to God. Ha!